Hello there. So I need to complete the story of stars. I think this lecture somehow got lost in the shuffle, so I'm just going to redo it entirely and post it on Canvas. So this is part two of uh, the lecture on stellar evolution, how stars evolve. And we're talking about stars like our sun, just sort of typical stars, not the big monster stars that are going to blow up. This is the story of most stars. And what happens is for most of their, their lifetime, if you will, they burn hydrogen into helium and they're on what we call the main sequence. But eventually the core of the stars gets crushed and it gets hotter and hotter and hotter. And at the very end, it starts to swell up into a red giant. But there's another point where the, the core can get so hot during that red giant phase that the core begins to burn helium into carbon. It's a new phase called the horizontal branch. It's kind of like a second main sequence and the star becomes stable again for a while and it kind of happily burns helium into carbon. But now the carbon core starts getting crushed and it swells out again into a red supergiant, stars like Antares. So that's kind of where we left off here in the story. And the rest of the story is quite interesting. Uh, here are some of those swelled up stars we talked about. So let's continue the story now. So it turns out that stars like our sun will never get hot enough to fuse carbon into carbon. They'll never get there. They'd have to get to 600 million Kelvin. They're only going to get to about half of that at best. So what happens? Well, the core is going to resist being crushed at some point. It's called electron degeneracy. The core becomes degenerate. It means that you have electrons up against electrons. All the empty space is gone now on the like the really atomic level and you have electron cloud up against electron cloud. Of course, electrons are negative, so they repel each other. And nature says, nope, this is, this is it. This is a roadblock. I like to call it a roadblock of nature. It's going to stop that from being crushed. Um, that's what nature is going to do. So uh, at this point, this material is unimaginably dense. Unimaginable. If you take a, a, a teaspoonful of this carbon material, of this core of this star at this point, uh, you couldn't even come close to picking it up. A teaspoonful weighs, let's say, roughly as much as your car. It's, it's really insane. And by the way, that stuff is still pretty hot. Yes, it doesn't get hot enough to burn carbon into carbon, but 300 million Kelvin. Yeah, wow. So that's pretty incredible. Remember, our sun's temperature right now in the core is at 15 million Kelvin for reference. Now, one interesting thing that can happen um, is that the core, which is made of carbon, you can have a, other types of fusion. It doesn't get hot enough for carbon-carbon fusion, but you could have, for example, carbon number six, fused with helium number two, and guess what? You've created oxygen, which is number eight on the periodic table. So you can have some oxygen, some neon, some other, some other elements that are created at that point, which is kind of interesting. So what's gonna happen? Now the core is crushed down into this super hot, super dense ball. What about the rest of the star? That's the core. What about the rest of it? All right. Well, that brings us to one of the most beautiful things in all of astronomy and all of space, and also one of the worst named things in space, planetary nebulae. Guess what? Planetary nebulae have nothing to do with. Take a guess. You got it. Planets. Um, they were misnamed by the great William Herschel back in the 1700s. Not his fault. He saw these sort of rings, um, and he thought, oh, well, th maybe those are rings that are creating planets, creating solar systems. See, to me, that's a, a brilliant thought. And those kind of rings exist. Uh, they're called proplids, protoplanetary disk, but that's not what he was seeing. He was seeing much bigger things called planetary, what, what, what he called planetary nebula, but they have nothing to do with planets. It's not the beginning of a solar system like he thought. It's the end of a star. So how does this end happen? Well, the, this, this star at the end, it gets very unstable. It's going to, to swell up and shrink down and swell up and shrink down until one day the outer part of the star, the whole atmosphere, all the outer part of it just sort of drifts away. It gets enough momentum. You know, the thing is pulsating and all of a sudden it gets enough momentum to just drift away from the core. It just separates. The shell drifts off into space. And it's not necessarily anything violent at all. It just literally starts drifting away. And that's when it's going to be called a planetary nebula. And I think what makes them really, really beautiful, excuse me a second, let me move myself here out of the way. What makes it really beautiful is that you have this white hot core that's left. 
and you have this shell of material drifting out. It, to me, it's like a lampshade. You have the little light bulb is like the core, and then you're lighting up this lampshade. And as you see, as you're going to see from the pictures, it makes them really gorgeous. These things don't last long. Let me mention that in case I forget to later. They actually don't stay around long because they're they're drifting away. So this is a very short stage um, in the life of a star. So some of the more well-known ones, the Ring Nebula. I've taken a picture of this one before, um, and it just looked like a little like a little tiny smoke ring in, in our telescope. But you're, I'm going to show you some awesome pictures here in a second of it. Um, and the Helix Nebula. So those are two that I would definitely feel free asking you on the test. The Helix Nebula, the so-called Eye of God, um, it gets a lot of attention. Um, so to me, and this is this is a Mr. Jeter thing. This isn't necessarily an official thing. Um, they're almost kind of like two types of planetary nebula. You have like here on the left, this is like the Ring Nebula and the Eye of God. And they're, they're, they're kind of symmetrical. And, and then on the right, you have ones that are a little more jumbled and chaotic. And uh, it seems to me like you could almost divide them into two broad categories. Maybe they do, and I'm not aware of it. Now, um, let's take a look at some famous ones. Okay, at the upper right, the Dumbbell Nebula. I've seen this one in our telescope, too. Kind of interesting. Probably the most famous one, honestly, is the Cat's Eye Nebula. The Hubble Telescope made that very famous. It made a lot of classroom wall posters back in the 90s. But but this page reminds me to tell you one thing. The colors, okay? Most of these are kind of false color, all right? It doesn't mean that the colors don't exist in these nebula. They do have color. It just means that the they, they they bring out the colors a lot. I mean, it's, it's not too different than what you do with your own pictures, right? A lot of times we don't just keep the original picture. We throw it into Instagram and change the filters and change this and that. And that's what astronomers do too. I personally think they sometimes do it too much because it kind of, to me, takes away a little bit when you do too much. But that's just my opinion. I try not to doctor mine too much. But I think that you see on this page, they've they've busted out the old coloring book for this one quite a bit in my opinion. All right, there is the Ring Nebula. And again, would it be that bright and colorful? Probably not quite that much. Um, but uh, but is, there, is it more blue in the middle and more red on the outside? Absolutely. Here's the Helix Nebula. It's the cover, for example, of the Cosmos series that we watch sometimes in class. You know, that's the opening scene and they open where it says Cosmos. Um, that's the the Helix Nebula. So let me point this out. This is a good one to show you. Look at this right in the center, right there. That's that core that's left, that super hot, white, dense core that's left. And this all around it is the shell. So that's not going to last long. This is going to, to drift away pretty quickly. The Fetus Nebula. Take a guess. Take a guess. Yeah. The Butterfly Nebula. There's the famous cat's eye. And when I talk about the coloring, look at the difference. This was the picture from the 90s that became famous from the Hubble. Okay, cat's eye. But, the, but then look at this. Here's a more recent picture. I mean, this is a better quality picture from 2007, but it's obviously it didn't change color. Uh, you know, they they just chose how to, to change the coloring of it. Um, I kind of trust this one more probably than the last one. But anyway, look at the detail. That's fabulous. That, that's incredible. Look at the detail around the, the core there. Look at the little strands and so forth, uh, little filaments of material. That's an amazing picture. Okay, so what happens next? What happens next? All right, let me move myself again here, get out of the way. All right, so what happens next is that shell is going to drift away pretty quickly, and you have this white hot ball of carbon left, and we are going to now call that a white dwarf. A white dwarf. So, this white dwarf contains half the mass of the original star, and yet it's the size of, let's say, the Earth. That's pretty insane. I mean, you know, uh, for example, that might be in, you know, 160,000 Earth masses, let's say, crunch down to the size of Earth. That's why the density is completely off the charts and crazy. Now, at this point, you notice it never got hot enough to fuse carbon and carbon, so there is no more fusion. I never actually personally call these white dwarf stars. To me, they're not really stars anymore, even though we kind of, you know, use that term a lot because there is no more fusion. Uh, the only example you need to know for the test, Sirius B. And guess which star it orbits? You got it. 
Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. Here's a picture right there. Look at that. There's Sirius, the bright star you see in the winter sky. And right there, you can see Sirius B orbiting it. And that's a white dwarf. That's a star that's done. It's burned out. It's, okay, it's at the end. So what happens next? Well, the final step, the final step is that thanks to the laws of thermodynamics, if you're a hot white ball of carbon and you're sitting in the cold vacuum of space, only one thing can happen to you. You're going to cool off. It's like leaving a hot cup of coffee in a cold room. You just eventually cool off and eventually a white dwarf will cool down enough that it won't give off light anymore and we call it a black dwarf. So a black dwarf is really the final product. It's the final stage of stellar evolution. It's a dark ball of carbon. Now, we have found so far in the entire universe, we've found zero of these. Zero. Now, why do you think that is? Why do you think we wouldn't have found any? Well, there are a couple of good reasons for that. First of all, they would be incredibly difficult to find, right? They're the size of Earth. They're the size of Earth, and they're not giving off light anymore. How in the world are you going to find that? I mean, the short answer is we're not, not anytime soon. And then here's another interesting thought on black dwarfs. Maybe, maybe, maybe they don't exist yet. Um, yeah. Why? Because maybe there hasn't been enough time for any stars like our sun. I'm having trouble here getting this to go to the next. Maybe stars like our sun haven't had time to, to go that whole route. Uh, right, because because this took this took a long, long time for all of this to happen, all these different stages. So anyway, um, that's pretty much the end. Why is this happening? Sorry about that. Well, I was kind of at the end anyway, so I'm just going to stop here <laughs> and say that that's that's the end. So you, after a star swells up into a red supergiant, the outer shell drifts away, leaving this white hot ball of carbon behind. And that brief phase where it's lighting up like a lampshade that's called a planetary nebula. And then what's left is the white dwarf, which after billions of years will cool down theoretically into a black dwarf. And that's the story of stars. That's the future of our sun. And it's the future of most stars in our galaxy. Thanks for listening.